So what I'd like to talk about is to do with uh, chronic illness and to look at psychosocial approaches that we've applied in some interventions. Uh, this wasn't the area that I started when I did my PhD. My PhD was more about developmental psychology. At the time I was doing my PhD, I had a little girl and I was incredibly interested in what she could do as she grew up. And she became the pilot data for all my research. So everything that I did for my PhD, I tested on my daughter. She's okay now, by the way. <laughs> Not, she hasn't suffered because of that. Um, but then in, in 2005, I met a respiratory paediatrician whose name is Anne Chang, who comes from Singapore by chance. Uh, she studied medicine in Melbourne and then now is at one of the children's hospitals in Queensland. So I met Anne in 2005 and we began a, this kind of professional relationship. She was very interested in coughing. And to me, coughing at the time was very trivial. You know, you get a cough, you get over it in a day or two, and you move on with your life. I didn't realise that coughing can become quite chronic. And there are people who live with cough for many, many weeks. And they cough hundreds and hundreds of times a day. And it becomes quite debilitating. And it becomes quite debilitating for their parents if you have a young child who has chronic cough. And this was Anne's area. And she was interested in this thing called quality of life. So up until 2005, I really wasn't, didn't know about it. It wasn't my area. But after meeting Anne in 2005 and chatting to her about coughing, and then chatting to her about quality of life, we decided to do some research in that area. And I'll talk about that tonight. But I want to start off by talking about the context of where this research happens. How many people here have been to Brisbane? Well, you better get out there and buy those plane tickets. I want to see you there next year, right? So um, Brisbane has a number of hospitals, big hospitals. And we had two children's hospitals until very recently. So this hospital was the Royal Children's Hospital, which was on the north side of the river. And we had another hospital called the Marta Children's Hospital, which is on the south side of the river. And in Brisbane, there's a huge divide on the river. So people on the north side of the river don't like people on the south side of the river and vice versa. And in Queensland Health, it's quite an issue. So when our government, our state government, about seven or eight years ago maybe decided we don't want two hospitals, we want one hospital. And that caused a huge furor amongst the children's hospitals, the both children's hospitals. They both thought they were losing something. So our research happened mainly at the Royal Children's Hospital, which is on the north side. That's the river that goes through, the river meanders through our city. And the Marta Children's Hospital on the south side. So at the time, the Premier of Queensland, the leader of the party, her seat of parliament, her seat was on the south side. So guess where the new hospital went? In her seat, obviously. So the new hospital, which is called Lady Salento Children's Hospital, was built right near the Marta Children's Hospital. And that's become the focal point for children's research now. And sitting behind that building, is another is called the Centre for Children's Health Research. So all the research that goes on with children's health happens beside that building. So Lady Salento Hospital is named after somebody called Diane Salento. Now you may not have heard of her, but she's very, she's very famous in some part of the world. Um, I think it's her mother. I think I believe was married to one of the James Bonds. I don't know which one, not Roger Moore, Sean Connery, I think. So one of the James Bonds was married to uh, Lady Salento's um, mother, and she herself is a, she's a dietitian and nutritionist and is heavily involved in health work. So this hospital is named after her. So that's our new hospital, that's how it looks. Um, and it's the centre point for children's health. And as I said, sitting behind that is the Centre for Children's Health Research where our research happens. So the research that I've been involved in since 2005 has covered a number of areas. And it began with the respiratory unit, the pediatric respiratory unit. And we looked at acute cough, quality of life, chronic cough, qu 
quality of life, Breathe Easier Online, which is a program I'll talk about tonight. And at the moment we're looking at indigenous quality of life. So the difference between acute and chronic cough. In children, it's four weeks. So someone who's been coughing for four weeks or more is seen to have chronic cough, and someone who's been coughing for less than four weeks is called acute cough. And we've developed questionnaires for both of those areas. In the burns unit, I've been involved looking at visible scarring, so scarring that can be seen. And in fact, with burns, it actually doesn't matter how big the burn is. What matters is what can be seen. So you can have a large burn on your chest, but that's not as, as dramatic or not as, not as catastrophic for the person as having a small burn on your cheek. So we look at burn scarring and cosmetic camouflage, and I have a student at the moment who look at visible difference. So an online program that we hope can make a difference to people at visible scarring. And the other area that we're looking at is in the diabetes unit, or within the pediatric, pediatric endocrinology. So in, in this unit we look at quality of life. We've also been looking at uh, the importance that parents see about treatment and the satisfaction that they're getting from treatment. I'm not sure about the system in Singapore, but when children and adolescents and their parents go to the diabetes clinic, they can sometimes be waiting for four and five hours to get seen. So they're sitting there for a long time and that's quite disturbing. And we're looking at ways to improve that across the treatment modality and the confidence. When the two hospitals were joined up, so when we had the Royal Children's on the north side and Martyr Children on the south side, each of the departments had to talk to each other about their mode of operation their mode of treatment, their delivery services. And what happens is it's each of the departments is very, very different about that. The Burns unit was fantastic because there's only one Burns unit on the Royal, on the, at Royal Children's Hospital. There was no Burns unit at the Martyr Children's Hospital, so there was no discussion. The respiratory unit was at the other extreme. So the ones on the north side, who I was associated with were heavily into research, were keen to do work with indigenous communities, travelled a lot. The people of the Mata Children's did not have that attitude towards their work. It wasn't their priority. And they had a lot of conflict about trying to come to terms with how they would treat, how they would deliver their services and having time for research. The diabetes unit was the one that I worked closely with at that time and it was great to see that the two units got together to talk about what would be the best, best mode of delivery and they invited me to come along and facilitate some of their discussions about that so they could provide the best service to their children, to the adolescents and to the parents. So each of the units work quite differently in terms of their attitude to research and their modes of delivery. The ones that I'll talk about tonight are the chronic cough, so I'll discuss rather briefly a measure that we developed and tested to see that we can understand this thing called cough, chronic cough. I'll talk about a program that we looked at in terms of cosmetic camouflage. So we weren't really interested in the camouflage per se, we were interested in the effects that it had on the children and the adolescents who used it. So being chronically ill, so this was a, from a, some focus groups that were held a few years ago and it's quite obviously debilitating. So the worst part of being, about being chronically sick isn't the physical pain, it's the emotional pain that goes along with it. You reach a point where you can't hold back the tears any longer and suddenly you're breaking down in the middle of a doctor's office. You think you can escape the emotional torture, your disease is purely physical, right. And I guess the med... I should preempt this by saying, are there any medical doctors here? Good. So you have to, have to be careful. Um, there are many medical doctors who don't pay attention to that emotional side. And their job, they will tell you, is to treat the physical part of what's going on. 
And a number of years ago, I had a head and neck cancer. And I know head and neck cancers are quite popular in, in Singapore. So I, and in fact, I looked at coming to Singapore for treatment because the treatment in Singapore is far advanced over what it is in Brisbane, but I stayed in Brisbane. And there was a point in that treatment where you have operations and chemotherapy and radiation, and you go through everything. And that's fine. Well, it wasn't at the time. It's fine looking back. But I can clearly remember visiting my doctor at one stage, the specialist, and, to, and I had all these questions. And I wanted some answers about certain things. And he said to me during this consultation, the only thing I'm interested in is your cancer and getting rid of your cancer. He wasn't interested in my emotional state. He wasn't interested in the, effect, the consequences of the treatment. And it has long-term consequences, the treatment for head and neck cancers. He wasn't interested in that. All he was interested in was that point in time, the cancer itself. And that hurt at the time because I wanted him to think about me as a person rather than just this kind of ball of cancer that was growing inside my, on my, in my tonsil and in my neck. So it kind of helped me along with my research to think maybe there's more we can do, you know, in people who have chronic illnesses to help them along that journey that they have. So the disease is purely physical. It's not. You know, it encompasses other parts of our life emotional parts of our life, the social parts of our life, and I hope that becomes clearer the longer that I talk. The ultimate measure by which to judge the quality of the medical effort is whether it helps patients and their families as they see it. And that's the important part. What does the patient think about this? And that doctor that I had didn't ask me that at all. He was only interested in those phys physical symptoms. So we have these things called patient reported outcomes, or PROs, and they're reported a little bit more often now, and they're gaining momentum. So these are things about treatment that come directly from the patient. They matter to the patient, and that's important. It's what's important to the patient, and in the, in the light of young children, what's important for the parents. Not just the children, but the parents themselves. And the last point there is about they shouldn't be interpreted. It's just what the person says. Don't, don't frame it in another way. Don't frame it in a biological way. You know, it's not necessarily biological. So, there are patient reported outcomes are things like signs and symptoms. So signs are things that you can see. So if I was panic stricken by giving public speaking now, you would see some things. What would you see? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably be doing this, right? My knees would be going like this. There'd be big sweat things under here, right? It'd be a great sight. So that's a sign. Well, my, a symptom is something that I would feel, but you couldn't necessarily see. So if I became nervous with public speaking, a symptom might be the butterflies in the stomach. That feeling, you can't see that looking at me, but I, I would be able to feel that inside me. So signs and symptoms. Uh, we also have functional status. So illness can affect people. When I was first diagnosed, I don't want to keep talking about my injury, I'm a bit over it now. But when I was first diagnosed, though this most incredible day in my life, incredible bad day, where 23 different specialists saw me in one day, one after the other, like ear, nose and throat people, physiotherapists, dentists, social workers, psychologists, oral maxillofacial surgeons, the list went, chemo, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, and so on and so on. And after they see you, they then talk about your case in another room, and then they elect somebody to come back and tell you the outcome, you know, the diagnosis. So a lady came back to tell me, but at the same time, one of the ENT people, the ear, nose and throat specialist came back. He wasn't supposed to. But he came back and he said that I would have to give up my career. He said, you're going to lose your tongue and you won't be able to talk again. So that's a functional status, isn't it? You know, that illness that I had, that chronic illness, would, according to him, was going to mean the end of my career. I've still got my tongue, by the way. Still working. 
Um, as it turned out, I, he was he was catastrophizing more than I was, and it was it was kind of a weird situation. And I had another ENT I'd already seen, so I quickly rang her up, and she helped me to understand what was happening. But that's what functional status is. If what you have affects your functioning, does it prevent you getting up in the morning? Does it prevent you eating, eating certain foods? Does it prevent you mixing with other people? And certainly some of the chronic illnesses that I'll talk tonight about interfere with social functioning. Adherence to treatment. We actually know by research that young people are very good non-adherers to treatment. They don't like taking medication. They don't like checking their blood to know what their glucose levels are like. You know, in the last couple of days I've been in Singapore, I found that the taxi drivers here talk a lot, <laughs> at least to me. And a taxi driver I had this afternoon had to tell me all about his type 1 diabetes. I don't know why. He's telling me about his blood pricks, and he showed me his, me he showed me his tablets. It was an interesting drive. It's one of those drives where you just want to get to the end quickly, you know, so you don't have to sit with him and listen and listen. But I listened and I did the right thing. But he was certainly adhering to treatment. The reason it came up was because I asked him about, do you work through the night? Do you work all day? And he said, no, he doesn't. He can only work between certain hours because he needs to take his blood samples. So he adheres to treatment, but teenagers don't. They don't want to take medication. They don't want to excuse themselves, not go to a party because they have to take a medication. Their parents don't want to let them go to a camp overnight because they have to take medication. So they, they don't adhere. Their experience is satisfaction, and that's why we were talking to people in the diabetes unit about are they satisfied with the treatment they're getting at hospital? We had a whole change in the system in Queensland Health about how you get your, how you get invited to a clinic. So these are clinics that people with diabetes have to go to once every six months, once they're established. And the respiratory unit it depends on the illness, whether it's cystic fibrosis or asthma or bronchiectasis or something else. And so it changed quite a lot. And what was happening is that normally you would finish your clinic and you'd, you'd get a, an appointment for your next time you had to go and visit. And you could you know, you could be flexible with that. But then they changed to say, we won't give you an appointment now, we'll mail you out the appointment two weeks before it's due to happen. And that would often conflict with things that happen at school, with exams, with parents' work and so on. So it really affected treatment satisfaction and the patient experience. Perceived quality of care. Do they think that they're getting the quality of care that they should be getting? Are they getting seen by allied specialists in all the areas? In respiratory unit, you get seen by a respiratory physician. In the diabetes unit, people get seen by endocrinologists, they get seen by an allied health specialist, they get seen by a dietitian, they get seen by a nurse educator, they get seen by a social worker, and they can get seen by a psychologist as well. So the diabetes unit has a great allied health team that works together looking at cases. Some of the other specialty units don't have that same quality of care. And then we have this thing called quality of life, which we'll talk about tonight. So what is it? this thing called quality of life. So the World Health Organization says it's something about physical, social and mental well-being. That's okay, it's the next part that's most important. It's not just those things, it's, and it's not just the absence of being ill or having a disease or infirmity. It's actually feeling good about yourself. So it's not just not being sick. That's important, not just not being sick. 
It's about an individual's perception about a number of things that I've got here, their position in life. So quality of life to you as an adult may be very different to quality of life to an adolescent. Will be very different to quality of life to a five-year-old child who's got chronic cough and so on and so on and so on. So it, it may be age determined but it's also determined by many other factors as well. It's about the culture where you live. So quality of life in a place like Singapore may be very different than quality of life in a place like Brisbane where I'm from. Quality of life in the middle of Russia may be very different from the quality of life in Middle East. So culture makes a difference. And part of the research that we've just started is looking at quality of life with indigenous people. Because we believe that indigenous people don't just think about physical well-being and social well-being and mental well-being. There are, there are many other things to indigeneity. And most of those are things like spirituality. Uh, the indigenous Australian people have an affection towards the land. So the land is very important and the family is most important. And like all things in psychology, nobody can agree on what makes up this thing called quality of life. You know, and intelligence is the same thing, isn't it? People can't agree on how many different types of intelligence we have. Same with quality of life. So we have this thing called quality of life. It may be about physical health, work, financial, personal safety, emotional well-being, social relationships, culture and spiritual. A whole lot of different things. And we need to be sort of functioning at all those levels to have quality of life generically. And then we have health-related quality of life. So we have this overall quality of life and then health-related quality of life. So it's a little bit, of, it's come out in the last four, 1980s to now, what's that? 37 years, right? The last nearly 40 years. It's at the individual level that it's important, so your own physical health. But it's also important to policy, to governments, because health is a costly thing to governments. And they need to be sure about what we've got in place for that, are we achieving the best results. So what are the domains? In terms of physical, there are things like physical activity, activity restrictions, physical symptoms, beliefs and feelings, disorders, how we feel is psychological, negative and positive feelings, self-esteem, cognitive functioning, general behaviour. And socially, for a young child, friends, school and family, or friends, university and family, um, and they take on different priorities at different ages, right? I think school and university is always down the bottom somewhere. But friends is up there number one, right? Most often up there number one. So why should we even think about measuring it? Do you walk up to somebody and say, hey, have you got good health related quality of life? They're probably not going to be able to give you a, an accurate, you don't walk up to somebody and say, are you depressed? Because they're going to say yes. So, you need to, so we need to be able to measure this thing and be able to measure it accurately. So that was the first part of the research that I did with this respiratory physician. But why do we want to do it? Why do we want to go to the effort of doing this? Well, most often you want to know from the patient's perspective how they're sitting in the world, but also you want to know that if we have an intervention of some sort, has it worked? We can tell in terms of physical way it works. Their blood glucose levels are fine, their blood pressure might be fine, uh, the scars on their face clear up, so on and so on. But quality of life is something very different. And that's the true indication of an intervention working. And we need it. And when you do research in this way, people who give you money to do research want to know that you're going to measure it and want to know that you're going to measure it in a reliable and valid way that it will get credible results. So we need it in terms of this. So, when we started, when we looked at this a bit later, we kind of thought, are there any other measures out there? And the answer is yes. There's a whole lot of ways to measure quality of life in adolescence with all of these disorders. There's about 30 up there. 
And there's probably more since I made this slide up the other day. They come out all the time. So is there a need for anything else? Hopefully the answer is going to be yes. Or otherwise we finish the talk right now. Okay? We'll just we'll go and eat. There are quality of life measures for children. And they're both generic, so it's general quality of life, not specific to an illness. And we have some that are child proxy, some that are proxy, and some that are children. So a proxy instrument is one that a parent will fill out for the child. So if the child is like five years of age and they, they can't, they may not be able to read, they may not be able to write answers, they may be able to think through questions properly, so we get parents to answer for the child. There's a whole lot of disease specific ones as well and these are those for children. So a range a whole lot. But what we noticed was there's nothing for cough. Should there be? Should we actually look at cough itself? And when you look at someone who's coughing, you look at someone who's chronically coughing. So chronic cough, remember I said, was four weeks non-stop. And when we started this, we would put tape recorders on the children's belts. And we would record how often they coughed. And our research assistants would actually count that. That's a pretty boring job, All right? Counting how often someone's coughing. But some of the children were coughing over 250 times a day. Now you think about that. 250, did somebody just cough then? Yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for that. So 250 times a day for at least four weeks. Imagine the impact that that has on the child, on the parents. And we wanted to be able to tap into that. What is that impact? So this is an original study, not by us, but it's carried out with focus groups. And it, it kind of gives a sense of why we need to measure this. Just have a quick read through. From a psychological perspective, there's something very important in that paragraph. Something very important. And that's that. Is my child going to live? Basically, that's what I want to know. Is he going to survive this? So parents doing all the polite things with the doctor, talking to the doctor, but in her head, this is the mother by the way, in her head she's wanting to know these answers. And that's important in the treatment. So if a mother or a father takes a child to the doctor, you're actually not just treating the child, you're treating the parents as well. Maybe not physically, and we know that, right? There are other ways that illness can impact. So cough, it's actually the most common symptom that's presented to doctors of a child and it's also the most common symptom at, in emergency departments. More parents take their children to emergency departments for coughing than anything else. And they panic, they worry, they're frustrated, they get angry because they're sitting there with their child cho seemingly choking. It's obviously distressing both to the child, you know, co both coughing over 250 times a day for days and days on end, and it's troublesome. It impacts on their life. You know, they don't get to sleep through a night without being woken up many, many times. And how many people in this room have children? So you all know what sleep deprivation is like, yeah? And you all know what that does to you. It does some very nasty things to us. And so if you have a child that's coughing through the night, it changes the dynamics in the family very, very quickly when people get tired. It has a negative effect on lots of things. And if your child is sick, do you go to work or not? Have I used up all my sick days? What happens? When I'm at work, I just worry all the time about my child. So it's impacting in a lot of different roles. It does produce those things, anxiety, worry, and obviously distress. The parent starts to feel not well. The child's not well, but the parent starts to feel not well in other ways. So we need to do something about that. So some of the symptoms of, 
of coughing, chronic cough by the way, four weeks. So there's a whole list of physical symptoms. Syncope is fainting. So people cough so much that they actually faint from it. Uh, vomiting, chest pains, hoarse voice, incontinence, hernia, sleep deprivation, lethargy. Some social relationship tensions, fear of public places. By coincidence, my mother developed chronic cough when I started working on this. Funny how the world works, right? Um, and she, they're quite old now, and they're actually just going into a nursing home or aged care facility, but they're not very social people. But what they would do is my mother became actually far less sociable because of her chronic cough. She was absolutely embarrassed by it. So she wouldn't go shopping. She wouldn't go to a restaurant. She wouldn't go out of the house because she didn't want to have one of these coughing fits in public. So it does interfere a lot, this thing called cough. Interferes with work. If you're on a telephone call and you start coughing and you can't stop, you know, what do you do? Do you hang up? And then psychological problems and there are a lot of negative things there, right? You get down about it. You can't escape it. You don't know how to escape it and it becomes incredibly frustrating. But by and large, people who've got chronic cough worry about what it's going to lead to. Is this the sign of something else, more sinister? Something that will be more dramatic? So how do we assess cough? Well, we count frequency and intensity of coughing. So 250 times a day for at least four weeks. Uh, we get their perceptions of cough. And we also look at the impact in terms of psychological, social and physical. And that's the aspect that we're interested in. And for parents, it's absolutely a burden. As a parent, you look after the treatment of your child. You give them the medication. You take them to the doctor. You're the one who prevents them from going to parties because you're worried about them. You prevent them from having sleepovers because you're worried about it. You prevent them from going to camps because you're worried about it. Okay, so the burden is on the parents in a lot of ways. And the other burden is the parent understands what's going on. So the five-year-old doesn't know why they're coughing and they don't know why they're having certain medication and they don't know what, really can't understand why I can't do this and why I can't do that. So that it's up to the parent to try and get that information across. And also to navigate the healthcare system. Healthcare systems are not easy to navigate. You know, we've got doctors, you have to go to a specialist, you've got to get referrals to do this, this, this and this. So it's not easy. So we were interested in what's the parent of a child with chronic cough like? I'm just going to move over here to wake these people up. What are, what are their concerns and what are their fears? So we developed an instrument to help with that. And these are the things that we found were important. And this is like a rank order from most important to least or less. The numbers down on the left hand side are just item numbers so they're kind of irrelevant. So in terms of worry, they're worried about the cause of the cough. They're worried about something more serious happening. They're worried about if it's going to cause damage. And they're worried about choking. Very much so. And what about the emotional side? They actually feel sorry for their child, they feel helpless, they feel frustrated, upset, stressed, anxious and sad. And what about the physical side? The physical side. It all comes down to being tired, yes? Sleep deprivation. So I think that medical doctors and specialists need to know that information about the parent need to know they feel stressed and tired and frustrated and angry and need to know that they are absolutely exhausted. So what are they like? They're like that. They're like that. And they're like that. Do you see yourself in any of those photos? I feel like this one. Right? Lucky I'm standing up. 
So they do, they feel frustrated, they feel anxious and worried, and they feel absolutely tired. So we developed this thing called, it's a parent cost specific quality of life, the acronym that PCQRL. And first of all, we wanted to know, is it good? Does it work? Is it valid? Are we testing what we want to test? So we measured it against things like cough counts, uh, VCD is a verbal category descriptor where they just rate the impact of their cough on a 1 to 5 scale and VAS is a visual analog scale from 1 to 10 again another method of looking at the impact so what's important over time so the QRL improved at the same time that the cough count went down at the same time that the, v the impact went down on both the VCD and VAS. So that's a good thing. And is it sensitive to change over time? So when we looked at all the items, we grouped them up into these five categories. Some were about emotions, some were about interfering with life, some were around annoyance. So before they had a clinical intervention, after they had a clinical intervention, so everything improved. So we kind of think that we're measuring this thing called quality of life. And since we've done that, it's actually been used by many people in four different countries. So it's been, it's been translated into Malay, into Turkish, into French, and English. And it's been used in a, a couple of countries around the world. Some of the pharmaceutical companies uh, have picked it up, which is a good thing for us because they pay for it. Uh, it's free to obviously students and people doing research in universities but pharmaceutical companies have lots of money so please if you if you own a pharmaceutical company come and talk to me so what do we know about the, for this part of the talk at least we can in managing children with chronic cough we need to look at quality in managing children with chronic cough we need to look at quality of life of the parents and we can do that, quick measure, short, ask some questions, give them this questionnaire and you'll find out. We need to show empathy. And I think we, to a great degree we need to show, ask some of our medical doctors to demonstrate that. And to think about their patient is not only this five-year-old child who's coughing. And if they can't handle that, is to come and ask some of you to help, to work with them. So, and going back to this quote, now this is one we started with. By the way, I'm worried. I really want to know, is my child going to live? And there's this underlying kind of question that parents will always ask. So that led us to this next step of doing a particular intervention with quality of life for children who have serious respiratory problems, not just coughing. So now we have children with cystic fibrosis, asthma, bronchiectasis, pleurisy and so on and these are children that are debilitating so they're hospitalized for many many weeks of their life uh, they are away from school for long periods of time uh, these are the other people who worked on the program with me uh, on the top right hand corner that's Ann Chang that's this little dynamo respiratory physician she's this tall but she's like a hundred miles an hour she's incredible She's very motivating to be around. She's the lady who was brought up in Singapore but now works. Uh, the top left hand corner is Tamara who's a researcher who worked with us. Leanne here is a psychologist. Helen's a nurse. Sophie's a nurse and Jeannie is a psychologist. So the group of people working on this particular project are a range of disciplines, not just psychs, right? not just psychs. So, what do we know about chronic respiratory problems? Well, they feel, children feel different, lonely and disconnected. This is not just cough, by the way. These are children who have to be hospitalised for periods of time because they have a severe asthma attack or the cystic fibrosis has taken a downwards turn or the bronchiectasis is playing up. And they feel disconnected from their friends at school because they are in hospital for long periods of time. They don't get to make the same friends and they feel disconnected from their friends because their parents don't let them go to these sleepovers or school camps because their parents are panicking 
Well, if they go to the school camp, the parents go with them. How embarrassing is that for a kid? You go on a school camp to get away from your parents and then they turn up and they're checking on your medication all the time. All right, so it's a quite disconcerting fact for the child. And the quality of life of the parents is affected as well. So the research shows us about ch adolescents, not just children, but adolescents. They become quite non-compliant. They don't like doing that. Not for a spiritual illness, obviously, but it, for someone who's a, with diabetes. But if you've got respiratory problems, they don't like doing the nebulizer or the Ventolin or checking things all the time. Or, you know, the physio that they need to undergo if they've got cystic fibrosis. They don't like it. It interferes with their life. And the last one, they forget it. You think, how do you forget something like that when you're meant to be doing it four times a day? Um, they forget it because they get on their social media. They get locked into that screen and it's the furthest thing from their mind. And they forget it because they want to forget it. I don't want to have to remember to do this all the time. So we developed this program called Breathe Easier Online. We called it, that's what we call it, BEO. It took us an incredibly long time to think of that name. Longer than to actually write the program. That's crazy, isn't it? Three words. But we had so many discussions about that. Breathe easier online. And the project is about, first of all, these children had chronic respiratory problems. Secondly, they were at risk socially. And that most of them came from one-parent families. Most of them came from low socioeconomic areas. Most of them came from areas where there were not a lot of resources. And their parents couldn't, their parents or their parent couldn't afford the specialist treatment that they were getting. We wanted to help them feel connected with somebody, with society in some way, and to improve their sense of how they felt about themselves. Build up their self-esteem, their self-confidence, their sense of identity and who they are. And hopefully, and I don't, we weren't successful in everything, and this is one of the things we're not successful in, helping them to be better adherers or compliant with their treatment. And we adopted this system called PACE. Now, I'm sure you're aware that if people who have this negative view of the world, you know, if you're depressed or you're angry or frustrated, or you have this kind of half-empty glass, you know, compared to the half-full glass. And if you have this half-empty glass, then it's very difficult to see your way through a problem. We kind of get very tunnel vision about how we see solutions. So what we try to do with these children and adolescents is work through a system of not just about their illness, but about other things in life. So it's about identifying problems and defining the problem and setting a goal. It's about looking at the alternative solutions. It's about choosing a solution and then acting on that solution. And we gave them lots and lots of scenarios to work through and they provided them as well. I'll give you an example. I arrived in Singapore yesterday and I'm staying in just near Orchard Road in one of the hotels behind um, can't even remember the name. The shopping centre on Orchard Road. Iron Orchard, Plaza. Pardon? Tank Plaza, Iron Orchard. There's more than one, aren't there? There's lots. <laughs> Paragon, is it? Yeah, Paragon. Paragon, yes. Somebody told me if you want to have a great dumplings, you go to Paragon and you go down to the basement. <laughs> and you probably know the place. Ding Tai Fong. Ding Tai Fong. So I was told to go there. So the problem was I wanted to eat. So I decided, let's try this out. So I go down to the Paragon, I walk down there, I go downstairs, and there's like a million different places to choose from. So the alternative solutions, there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of them. But I held true 
and I found this place. So I made a decision, I want to eat there. So I went and ate and I executed. How did I execute? I enjoyed the food. So I, I worked through that, it wasn't really a problem. It's a very trivial example. But it's what we did with the children and the adolescents. You start with a trivial example, you work your way through it, and you build up the intensity of those problems. You know, like systematic desensitization. An easy problem first to work through, and gradually more and more difficult, and more and more meaningful to them. So pace, identify the problem, define it, think about all the alternative solutions, choose one of those, and then execute it. Now, to do this research, we were given quite a bit of money by a group called Telstra. Telstra are telecommunications like Singtel. And they gave us some money to do this research. Because the children were disadvantaged and at risk and from low socioeconomic areas, we actually bought everybody in the study a laptop. And we bought them all a modem. And we bought them all internet connection for 12 months. Pardon? So we did all of this. I will never do it again. Never. When you give somebody something like that for free, they tend to not look after it. So most of the laptops spent most of the time getting repaired. Lucky they're under warranty. But we had people living all over Queensland, so they'd have to send them down to us, we'd have to send them away to get repaired. They dropped them, they spilled drinks on them. That was one thing. The other thing was the internet that we gave them had a download limit. So as soon as they get this free internet and free laptop, they're downloading movies, they're downloading songs, concerts, these are adolescents, right? And they'd run out of their limit. They'd hit the quota and they wouldn't have any room on the quota then to do our program. <laughs> All the best intentions, huh? So we, we wouldn't do it in the same way again. We, you learn a lot, don't you, by doing something. We thought we'd, they'd treasure this thing called a laptop and they got to keep it, right? It's, it's theirs now and they treasured this thing called the internet and they treasured it so much that they'd probably watch more movies than I've ever watched for free. But that's what we gave them. And we developed a website, that's why it's called online. And the website had these three characters on the right. It was password protected so their parents couldn't get in and watch and see what they were doing. But we had a, mirror, we had a, a parallel site for the parents and it introduced, and once they logged in, they looked at a page like this. And down the left-hand side was my condition. So in kind of child-friendly talk, we explained what asthma was. We explained what cystic fibrosis was. So they could read that. And my page is kind of the equivalent of Facebook. Right? They could put up their photo, they could put up a story about themselves, they could tell everybody how badly they felt at a certain time or how great they felt or who they were angry with. We were monitoring the site. The psychologists in the program were monitoring the site. So we kept a careful check on the kinds of conversations that were going on. My talk was email, discussion board, blogs, those sorts of things. My work is the key part. So my work was the modules that they had to work through about that pace, the problems, the alternative solutions, choosing a solution and then executing, and then logging out. So when they went into my work, there were eight modules in total. There's only two came up here, and the reason is that the other ones came up when they'd finished one. So you'll see module one is up there that they're working on. It says module two is not available yet, and three, four, five, six, seven, eight aren't there at all. So when they finish two, module three would appear. And we did that so they wouldn't just race through. We wanted them to do a module over a week, you know, to spread out the learning, not so concentrated in 
you know, two hours of heavy, heavy kind of learning. It was a random controlled trial. It ran like this, so they were randomly assigned to a control group or an active group. The active group got the laptop and they got the modem and the 12 months internet. Now, we have very strong ethics procedures for our research and if you have a random controlled trial, for us we have to provide the intervention to both groups at some point. You can't restrict the control group from having the intervention. So they all, no matter which group they're in, they all eventually got a laptop. If you look at the control group, their intervention is down towards the far right hand corner side. So we're interested obviously at pretest to make sure that the groups didn't differ. If they're randomly controlled, you hope that one group's not sort of more depressed than the other. It shouldn't be. And then we obviously want to check after the intervention. So this is the group. There are 42 in total. About half of them were boys and girls. Mean age was about 30, 13 and a half years of age. 23 had cystic fibrosis, 14 had asthma, and there were five other conditions, and 21 in each of the groups. Psychologists like to measure things, yeah? So we measured heaps of things. When you got them, you've got to measure it. Um, most of those are psychological measures, obviously. Uh, the DAS is a depression, anxiety, and stress scale that comes out of Sydney. Um, SCAS, S-C-A-S, is a Spence Child Anxiety Scale. That Sue Spence used to be head of our school in psychology at UQ. And she's now at Griffith University. As a social problem solving scale, there's a depression scale and so on and so on. The spirometry at the bottom left there is a, a lung capacity test. So that's a physical test to see the capacity of the lungs. So the results. In terms of social problem solving, uh, from the child's perspective, NPO is negative problem orientation. You know that half empty glass. The ones I've circled are where we had significant differences. So less, significantly less on negative problem orientation, significantly less on impulse and carelessness. You know, acting impulsively. So now they're actually thinking through the problems rather than making a quick decision without thinking about it. I'm going to give you an exam at the end on all these graphs too, so pay attention. In depression, big difference. Before and after, so depression is less. The child health questionnaires has a number of different scales. Uh, the ones that are circled are have improvements, so physical functioning, family activities, mental health and time impact. So they're all reverse scored. So even though physical functioning, the post-test score is lower, it, you've got to think that in a negative way. So it's lower on negativity. What do parents think? Before I put these up, what do you think about parents? Oh, no, no. That's a pretty crazy question. I'm sorry about that. How do you think parents think about their children in a chronic illness? More positively or more negatively than the child will themselves? In other words, do parents underestimate the impact of the illness or overestimate the impact of the illness? It varies a little bit, but by and large they overestimate it. They, over, they worry more about the child, and they think the child worries more than the child actually says they worry. And that came out in some of our results. So this is the Spence Child Anxiety Scale. Uh, PAA is Panic Anxiety and Agoraphobia, Separation Anxiety, Personal Injury Fears, Social Phobia, it's a big test, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, and generalized anxiety disorder across the bottom. And the pre and post show differences there for parents. And when we looked at the children, there was only the personal injury fears they were worried about, which are here. So there's a little bit of a difference between what parents thought and what the ch about the child and what the child actually thought. Ooh. 
I guess we wanted to know what do they think about the program. And by and large, they're very positive. Almost 100% say they're happy to do the program, and over 90% say they'd recommend the program to something else. But you learn a lot about a program. I'm only going to tell you positive things. There were some negative things, and one of the things that we felt was the program was too text heavy. Heaven forbid we made them read too much. You know, we should have made it more animated, more kind of interactive. And if we'd got some more money, we would have done that because they had to read a little bit too much. But what do they say? How many sessions are there? I never want the program to end. Thanks for choosing us. It's a good website to learn about what other people feel like and what other people's conditions are like. That's important. I'm not the only person feeling like this. You know, if I've got asthma, you kind of think you're the only person in the world who's like this. It's great to be able to share that with other children who are feeling the same way. It was good, it felt good to be doing it. And the parents, I thought the program benefited, whoever it was, to not feel so alone. This is neat, they were able to communicate. They started talking more. And they actually started talking more to their parents about it. They felt that the children were talking more. Joseph is like most teenagers and does not communicate about some things, but this one thing she does really talk about. Thank you. Isn't that that's nice to hear from a parent? Thank you. It's achieved something for that family. And the rest of the family discussed the feelings a lot more, health and well-being. Perfect for the parent and child. I want to thank these guys. Right? They help. They help these 43 people. They help them feel better about themselves. They help the, the parents actually be able to communicate to their children. And they help with some of their problem solving as well. So that module. But remember, it's not without its failings. And those failings are about other than misusing their laptops and the modems and the internet. But it was just, we didn't get results. We thought we'd get significant results everywhere. And that was uh, bringing you back to earth a bit, to say not everything is going to work with everybody. Now, the last study that I like to talk about is one that's quite dear to me. It's about children who are burnt and have got visible scars and the impact that that can have on their life and then the impact that something that you do with those children can also impact on their life in a positive way. So the three people who worked with me on this project, uh, the person on the left, his name is Roy Kimball, he's in charge of paediatric burns in, at the hospital. The person on the right, Graham Martin, he's a psychiatrist and the girl in the middle is a social worker and I was a psych person who worked. So there were a team of four of us who worked with this. So, paediatric burns. We know that their body image and self-esteem are significant in that population. Even if you don't have a burn, a visible scar, body image is absolutely important for teenagers. How they look at themselves in the mirror is incredibly important. I don't know what their life would be like without a mirror. Or their life would be out without a phone that they can't take a selfie. But think what that changes if you burn yourself severely. Or you get caught in a fire. Or some hot water, boiling water from the stove falls on you. That changes a lot of things. And one of those things obviously is quality of life. Across all the different aspects of quality of life. So they struggle with their appearance. And this is important. Even though it's a negative, the size of the burn or how severe it is is not important. What's important is where it is, if it's visible or not. If you've got a huge scar, as I said before, on your chest, doesn't matter how bad that is, you can get away with it. You don't have to go swimming. You can wear a sun shirt if you need to. 
But if you've got a burn on the back of your hand, on the side of your face, then that has an impact. Because people see it and they stare. So we looked at this thing called a cosmetic camouflage. So that's not a psychological intervention itself. It's a physical intervention, but we wanted to look at the psychological effect of it. So the aim, we, there are two aims we had in this study. One was to actually make sure that, not make sure, but to test or evaluate whether children with visible scars were different from the, from the population that didn't have visible scars. And then to actually do something about that. So this is a sample. What about the exam? <laughs> we have to give them a pass now, Ken. So the sample was 66 people that were around about just under 13 years of age. Three quarters of them were females. Nearly 60% of them were Australian, 8% were Aboriginal, uh, Indigenous population, and 5% were Samoan. TBSA is total body surface area, so the percentage of the body surface area that was burnt. So they can calculate that, and it was around about a quarter of the body, by and large, was burnt. About seven and a third years since the burn happened. So these are not, these are not young people who've just been burnt. This is seven years on average since they've been burnt. The injury area, so 38% of them had multiple areas like thigh, arm and chest. And 30% of them had multiple areas that included the face and head. And how did it happen? 46% of them were scalding, you know, the hot water, boiling water, and 41% with the flame. And I'll show you some photos of some of them uh, in a little while, both from scalding and from burning. So we're testing whether, first of all, whether that sample ha feel about their quality of life. Is it different? So this is our healthy sample, and this is the burn sample, and they were different in terms of school functioning, psychosocial health, and the to total score. Importantly, on their perceived physical appearance, which you'd expect, perceived physical appearance, See, much, much lower than a healthy sample, or a cancer sample, by the way, cancer sample. What about parents? So remember that. See the three red lines? That's the three ones that are significant. What did we say about parents before? I overestimate so. Look at that. Big difference, isn't there? What the parents thought about their child, the problems that their child were having, everywhere. And likewise for the perceived physical appearance. In terms of uh, strengths and difficulties, so differences for hyperactivity, inattention, and differences on peer problems. So more peer problems for children who have visible scarring. And that's a total score, again different. And again, if we look at parents, you can probably tell me what we'll find. Everywhere, it's quite incredible, isn't it? A marked difference in all those measures. And again, with the healthy population. So what do we know? Well, our sample compared to the norms for health-related quality of life and strengths and difficulties, significant differences, all in a negative direction. Uh, it tells us we need to do something with that population. If they're feeling so negative about themselves now, and that's still, on average, seven years since they were burnt or scolded. That's long term. It's not going to get better by itself. So we need some increased psych psychosocial report. So we decided to do this big study. Well, big in terms of, not numbers of people, but big in terms of where it went. 
So there's a particular product called Microskin. So you know, remember before when I told you about those laptops and modems? I never do that again. Well, unfortunately, Microskin, or when you do work with a private company and they give you money to do things, they have a different idea about research. So we, in research, we try and standardise everything that we do to make sure that every participant gets the same treatment, the same instructions. Microskin, what do you think their goal is? A private company, what is their goal? They want to make money. So every time we did an instruction here, they went into a big sales pitch, which is devastating for us. We had to pull them aside a few times and say, look, we want to make sure that you'll make your money if we can show that this is having an impact. But we won't be able to publish this or talk about it if you have this incredible sales pitch every time that's different. There's a whole big product that goes with Microskin that I'm going to talk about. And so the people in the study were given this thing, all these products, while they were in the study. So if, if they liked it, they could then keep it, but they had to buy it at a discounted price. And that's what Microskin wanted them to do. We weren't interested in that. We just wanted to know, psychosocially, could we have some improvement? So the random control, we had a waitlist design, again, intervention and a waitlist group. And we did it at six major centres across Australia and New Zealand. We should have come to Singapore. So we were based in Brisbane, obviously, but we went to Sydney, Hobart, Adelaide and Perth in Australia, and we went to Auckland in New Zealand, and all the major children's hospitals in those cities. So another interesting thing about research is that because we had Microskin as a private company, we had to have a legal agreement with them and then we had to have a legal agreement with each of the hospitals. And we had to have ethics approval from each hospital. And I, I never realised that ethics committees all think differently. So one group of ethics would tell us you have to fix this up, and another ethics group would tell us you have to fix this up, which is different from that group. So we spent many, many months you know, getting ethics from all these multiple hospitals because they all wanted something very different. So this Microskin is a cosmetic camouflage. It's, it's a spray. You spray it on. Your skin is tested first of all to find the colour and computer generated perfect colour image. And then it's sprayed on. I'm not selling it by the way, I'm just telling you. <laughs> I got no money out of this. They spray it on and it lasts for about four days. So I've got a birthmark here and they wanted to use... I forgot what side. <laughs> here. I've got a birthmark and they wanted to use it here but I said no, I'm okay with that. But they spray it on. It can last for four or five, four days or so. It's waterproof so they can go swimming with it. They can have a shower with it. You know, and the pictures I'll show you, you see that it's quite incredible what it does. So it lasts for several days in a breeze. So you can sweat. It's not like mascara, right? I believe that runs down your face, doesn't it? You know, when you cry? Well, this doesn't. It doesn't run. There's a whole lot of equipment that goes with it. You've got to learn how it's, you spray it on like a very tiny spray, uh, filter, like spray paint, but it's very like a pencil thick. And once you get the, and you've got to do it in a certain way to get it even. So, in because of that, that's the, that's the image that we get the actual colour from. So that's over the skin. And then there's a day and a half of instruction. So the children were taught how to use it. And to apply it. And most importantly, how to clean it. You know, if you're using a very tiny nozzle, that's going to get clogged up. So it won't work after a few days if it's not cleaned properly. And these are children from all over Queensland. And this is where Microskin went crazy with their sales pitch. 
we couldn't control what they were doing when they walked around and talked to people. So there's a girl that has a, a scarring down her neck that's before microskin and after microskin. Uh, these two uh, girls are from Indonesia and a number of years ago they were on Aceh and Aceh in Indonesia when the tsunami hit. And when the tsunami hit they lived in a, an old hut with their parents and a brother. And the tsunami hit and it knocked over a lantern and their hut burst into flames. Their parents got out, their father went back and got the son first and by the time he went back for the two daughters they were severely burnt. They were then brought to Brisbane to be treated and between them they've undergone over 50 operations over time. So when they, and this, these pictures you see here are after a number of operations. So they were sponsored to come to, a, to Brisbane. They went to school in Brisbane for a while. So the one on, they both went to the school. You see the T-shirt on the right? That's Karabi State School. That's on the south side of Brisbane. So families took them in, looked after them for many years. They've now gone back home. But just to see what the camouflage does, the girl on the left, so the before and after, and for the, her younger sister, before and after. So it has quite an effect. Just two others. Uh, the girl on the left, when she was two years old, she did the thing that I think most parents fear. There was boiling water on the stove. And she reached up and grabbed it and it spilt all over her. So she scalded it all the way down and you'll see the scalp on the left hand side there where she's lost the hair. So that's the before, and she's got scars down her, her left arm, or your, the right hand side as you look at it. And she's got it over a lot of her body as well. So this is her when she's, I think, 11 or 12. So this is 10 years after the, the incident. So this is before micro skin, and then this is after, so quite significant. Uh, the boy on the right hand side, when he was about 14 or 15, he was, no, when he was 11 or 12, sorry, he was playing with some friends and they were playing with this gas cylinder and he was worried that the gas cylinder would explode. So he took the gas cylinder off a friend and when he did it exploded in his face. So he's got that scarring on the right hand side of his cheek there and his jaw and after micro skin it looked like that. So it has quite an effect physically and visually to somebody else. Does it have an effect on the child? That's what's important. Doesn't matter if we look at it and think, gee, that looks good. Does it look good for the child? So the study design I've already mentioned, uh, we pre-tested them on lots of measures. They had the training course for one and a half days. We took photos of the children with their permission, of course. Uh, they get trained, they take it away and for, they applied for two months. They applied when they feel like they need to apply it. You know, if they're going to a party, they're going to school, they're going swimming, so they apply it, they look after it, and the control or the wait list group, you'll see at three months they get the opportunity as well. So again, a number of measures, quality of life is kind of the theme of today, so we're measuring that. Strength and difficulties, did it have an effect on family functioning? And did it have an effect on their self-concept? There's, there's nothing physical there. And we had to do this. You know, Michael Skinner wanted to know, is there evidence for the use of this, question, this uh, instrument? So this sample, there are 35, just over 12 years, under 70% of the females, Again, near about a quarter of their body was affected by the burns, a total burn surface area. Almost half of them were scalding and almost half of them were from a flame. Multiple areas. And the caregiver primarily was the mother. So similar kind of a sample. 
So pre-intervention, we, so we tested them before they got the micro skin, and then we looked at them afterwards. So their physical functioning was better, their school functioning was better, their perceived physical appearance was improved, and their whole, <clears throat> so quality of life, total score had improved. That was important. Oh, the difference between those is the circles are significant. You've all studied psychology, yes? Yeah? So you know about statistical significance. Nobody can get through psychology without knowing about stats. So the circles are probably less than 0 0.05 and the lines are probably less than 0 0.10. Strength and difficulties. We only had so peer problems, that's important. Fewer, significantly fewer peer problems. That's not bad. And significantly fewer emotional problems. Microskin questionnaire, what do they think about it? Well, by and large, they thought the scars look better. By and large, they said they will continue to use. So 94% they continue to use that product. Microskin micro loved that. Right, they love that. And by and large, they felt happier. Sometimes true was, oh, it's not there, some percentage. Uh, mostly true, about a quarter, very true for 9%. 9%. So 100% of them said scars look better or much better. It didn't limit them doing what they wanted to do. They could play cricket, they could play football, they could do badminton, they could swim races. You know, all that kind of stuff. They could be with their friends. That's pretty important for an adolescent. They felt happier, they felt more confident. Children didn't look at their scars. Imagine what it's like walking down with my birthmark. Kids look at my birthmark. And when they look at it, it feels like my birthmark is here. Imagine if you're 13 and you've got scars and kids look at your scar. Imagine how they feel. Right? So they're much happier knowing when other people are not looking at their birthmark, uh, at their scar. Much more confident therefore in a public place. Microskin loved that. You imagine. The colour is great and we did some focus groups afterwards and some interviews. The colour is great and really diminishes the look of my scar when it's on. 15 year old female says that. I was so nervous, anxious and scared about coming out of my garments, but Microskim has made me feel so much better about it. Why is this not available to all kids with burns? It should be. It is so awesome. When a teenager says awesome, you know you've got it. Right? You know it's good. But I don't really care about microskin. But when they say that, they feel better about it. It should be available to everyone. It's awesome. That, that gives you a lot of confidence, doesn't it? And how they feel about themselves. So what do we know? Well, from this study, there were significant changes in how they looked at themselves in terms of appearance and quality of life. It may be a valid intervention for children and adolescents living with burn scarring. Doesn't have to be microskin, can be anything. But from a psychosocial perspective, it worked for these kids. So these are the people that have helped through some of the studies that I've talked about tonight. 